I am Catherine André, editor, director, and co-founder of Vox Europe, and I am based in Paris. Hello from Brussels. I'm Gianpaolo Accardo, editor-in-chief and co-founder at Vox Europe. This year has all the makings of a new milestone for Europe. It's a super election year with almost half of the world's population summoned to polls, including a record number of Europeans in early June. The more than likely re-election of Vladimir Putin in Russia and the potential breakthrough for far-right parties at the European elections. And finally, this year, we will have a critical US presidential election. We will discuss all of this with uh, Professor Timothy Gatonash, whom we are particularly happy and honored to have today. Timothy, you are a British historian and journalist, a political writer and columnist for The Guardian, as well as a regular contributor for the New York Review of Books. You are teaching European studies at Oxford and Stanford universities and have traveled extensively throughout Europe, especially Central and Eastern. Your latest book, Homelands, A Personal History of Europe, where you draw on uh, half a century of travel and hiking and thinking to uh, a wall and free continent, has been translated into 21 European languages, though you might have to wait for January for French, Dommage. You're also a member of Vox Europe's uh, ethical committee, which we are honored and grateful to. In less than three weeks, it would be the... Oh, sorry, Timothy, maybe you wanted to say where you're based. I'm based... It's a great pleasure to be with you. And I'm based in Oxford, Europe. <laughs> After Brexit, one has to emphasize that. <laughs> okay, that's... Thank you. Uh, Timothy, in less than three weeks, it will be the second anniversary of the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, which led to the lar largest war since World War II in Europe. Uh, according to you, has this war changed the face of Europe, maybe forever? And if so, in what way? Um, you wrote a year ago that this war is already something much more serious than the invasions of the Soviet Union of Hungary in 1956 and Czechoslovakia in 1968, and you've witnessed the historical change of era that happened in 1989. And we'd like to know, and that was a change for the best, of course, and how do you see the current change? Um, how do you analyze it? Well, first of all, let me say it's a great pleasure to be with you because I think Vox Europe is doing a terrific job. And actually, you know, I think our we have a European policy which is ahead of our politics and then our politics are in many ways ahead of our public sphere. So it's any effort to create more of a European public sphere is fantastic and, and you're doing a great job. To your question, Catherine, you know, what, what I argue in the book is that we've now seen the end of two eras. Uh, the first is the post-war period identified by Tony Jart, 1945 to 1989, but in a sense, running on after 1989. And the second is the period I identify in the book, what I call the post-war period, the period that goes from the fall of the Berlin Wall, 9th of November, 1989. And I argue provisionally, because it has to be a provisional argument, that that ends on the 24th of February, 2022. And so I think the significance of the war in Ukraine, which is, after all, the largest war in Europe since 1945. It's everything that Europeans swore um, to prevent ever happening again with the formula never again after 1945 um, is an enormous caesura. And I think it marks the end of that post-war period with its hopes and its illusions about moving to a Europe of, of, if you like, perpetual peace. And what, what that means is that these years are particularly important because, you know, in, in politics as in relationships, beginnings are crucial, right? The first few months or years are more important than something 10 or 15 or 20 years down the line. You know, in the, in the years after 1945, Essentially, we shaped the international order for the next 40 years. In the years 1989 to 1992, we essentially shaped the European order for the last 30 years. So what we do in these years, 22, 3, 4, is 
probably more important than what we're going to do in 28 or 2030 or 2031, starting with whether we enable Ukraine to win this war or merely not to lose it, but to lose one fifth of its territory. I mean, that for me is absolutely the first and most urgent question for this year. Thank you, Timothy. Um, speaking of Ukraine, you, you've traveled several times in Ukraine in the past two years. So what is changing in the people's people you met there, in, in their mood and their uh, resoluteness, maybe? We often read that Ukrainians are tired of the war. What, what kind of exit uh, do they see and what are their hopes and what, and what are yours? Um, Gian Paolo, indeed, I've been four times since the beginning of the full-scale war. And the first thing to say that some of the people I met are now dead. They died at the front. I mean, the scale of the casualties. Uh, the U.S. estimated 70,000 dead and more than 100,000 wounded last summer. And it's a lot more than that by now. Every Ukrainian you meet knows of as a friend or someone in the family who's been killed or wounded um what i would say is that the last two times i've been which are last july and last october i was very struck by the degree of exhaustion sheer exhaustion people looked like they'd aged you know six years and six months and um and trauma no question trauma but that does not translate, and this is a great misunderstanding in, in the US and, and many parts of Western Europe, that does not translate into wanting a territorial compromise, right? Into wanting a peace negotiation. Of course, people want the war to be over, but not at the price of sacrificing one fifth of your territory, which by the way, the territory controlled by Russia is equivalent to the whole of Portugal and most of Slovenia. That's the size of it. Millions of Ukrainians lived in these territories. So there is absolutely exhaustion. There's worry about how the war is going, namely badly for Ukraine, because it is going badly. Um, but that but 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 still resolution and determination. And my biggest worry, Gianpaolo, is that the pressure is growing particularly because of the prospect of Trump 2.0, who would be a disaster for Ukraine. Mm. I mean, it'd be an emergency for Europe, but a disaster for Ukraine. The the, the temptation is growing, I think, in, in Berlin and Paris and, and uh, Brussels even, to say, let's try and settle for the ter current territorial division, right? And to say, that would be a kind of victory for Ukraine because four-fifths of the country would have the prospect of EU membership and some sort of security guarantees, maybe even NATO membership. But every single Ukrainian would regard that as a terrible defeat. And Vladimir Putin would be able to go back to Moscow and say, I won. This is a great victory. And the rest of the world, I don't know if you saw the polling, my Oxford Research Project did it with ECFR. The rest of the world thinks the West is fighting Russia in Ukraine, and it thinks Russia is going to win. So for the credibility of the West and Europe in particular, that would be a disastrous outcome. Okay, that, that of course already brings the very major um, importance of the US election uh, for Europe and for Ukraine, you just uh, stated. and. And um, um, of course, um, if a possible return of Donald Trump uh, made a difference, how do you see it within, as I, I would say, the, the 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 financial aid package that the EU just managed to agree on, uh, bypassing actually uh, Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban, uh, and, and Zelensky uh, is thankful for that. But of course, he's, he's stating again, just stated again that. That's not enough, and 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 they they, they would need uh, basically military aid, which the AU at the moment cannot provide uh, for um, for the reasons we all know that it's not um, 
wouldn't be constitutional in a way. Uh, so do you think that um, in a way Europe should maybe rearm itself? And uh, what would be the way forward with this this, this danger of Trump re, 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 you know, coming back in power to power? So first, so first of all, Catherine, I think the probability of Trump becoming the next uh, US president is, is well over 50%. It's not just that he's got the nomination. If you look at the polling in the battleground states, where you know a few tens of thousands of votes decide the issue, he's, he's way ahead. I, I mean, obviously, you know, nine months is a very long time in politics and anything can happen. But, you know, if we're not preparing for that, then we're doing something very wrong. And I think we're not, we're all talking about it, but we're slightly like rabbits in the in the, in the headlights of an advancing car. We're not actually, you know, I've just written a column in The Guardian and my motto is don't be scared, be prepared, right? Uh, the answer to your question, Catherine, is if we started now giving the big, secure, coordinated European orders to our defense industry and to some extent still to US arms manufacturers, we could as Europe absolutely do it, we could step into that gap. The German economy is twice the size of Russia's. The EU's economy is more than seven times the, the, the size of Russia's. If we, if we had the political will, we could do it, and I think we should do it. Um, but whether we're gonna do it is another question. And there, as I say, I have, I have, I have major doubts. Um, and, um, you know, I think if we don't, then if we wake up after the Trump is elected and say, cripes, we've got to do something about this, it will actually be too late because what Ukraine and Russia are doing competitively in 2024 is probably going to decide the outcome of the war in 2025 or 2026, right? Uh, so I, I really think it needs a effort of collective European political will to do that and we can absolutely do it if we if if we have the if we have the if we have the political will but then of course the larger question is how do we react to the trump shock right and uh, i mean emmanuel macron is quite rightly saying it should lead us to unite i agree with him but it's also analytically possible to think that it may divide rather than unite right mm -hmm with East Europeans still wanting to make special deals with Washington to, to, to secure their defense, right? And uh, some countries like potentially Germany or Italy are saying, well, we've got to make a deal with Putin. Um, and so you would actually have a, a Trump shock that divides rather than unites. I think, I think that's a real danger. And do you think, Timothy, that the, um, the outcome of the European election would have an... Uh... An impact on that, and also, uh, okay, they are not linked, but uh, of the UK election. So let me take them in turn, Gianpaolo. First of all, I think the most important European election takes place in the US in November. I, mean, I think there's no question about that. Um, but obviously, the European elections will have an impact. I'm sure several of you saw the ECFR polling um, suggesting that actually the hard right could do very well indeed. And clearly Viktor Orban, who we have to talk about because he's in many ways the third big problem that the European Union has next to Putin and Trump is Viktor Orban is clearly hoping that he can put together the ECR and the identity group in the European Parliament and make a major hard right grouping, which even if you have a kind of grand coalition of, 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 of the two largest groupings, um, you know, is going to be a formidable force and would be pushing for compromise with Russia. So, yeah, I think it will play into that, uh, which is why it's so important that 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 people mobilize to 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 constrain the hard right vote. I mean, look at the polling in France. 
look at the polling in Germany for AfD. I mean, these are very large numbers. Um, UK election, sideshow in a sense, but a small glimmer of light. We are going to, if you'll pardon my French, kick the bastards out, uh, which is a traditional English phrase, um, after 14 years of of really disastrous years for, for Britain, both in terms of the consequences of austerity policies and then Brexit. And unless something very strange happens, the next British Prime Minister will be called Keir Starmer by the end of the year. And oddly enough, this context in which you have Europe threatened by Putin advancing from the East, Trump potentially withdrawing from the West, and the hard right pushing, so to speak, from underneath, so threats from three sides, if you like, uh, is one in which a reset between Britain and the EU becomes possible, right? And what I'm arguing for is a big reset under the, under the single heading of security, but not just military security, defense, you know, foreign policy, but also economic security, energy security, digital security, democratic security, democratic security, securing our democracies against uh, the dangers of AI and disinformation and so on, and creeping authoritarianism. So I think that is a real possibility. The question is whether Keir Starmer has the vision and the to use an English colloquial word, the welly, the the oomph, uh, to actually seize that possibility, or whether he's just going to be Sunak plus little by little. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it's for sure that there's a growing momentum, as you just said, for the far right um, to actually uh, take a more and more important role uh, and space uh, after the European elections. Uh, but at the same time, we have um, massive anti-AFD demonstrations in Germany. You've lived in Berlin and you know Germany very well. And, and uh, th this is that can, can maybe give hope that there might be a surge. And maybe we also talk about the situation in Poland afterwards. But um, do you, how do you analyze the, uh, the maybe um, the sort of civil society uh, role in all this? I mean, finally, German civil society has woken up, I would say. Mm. But, you know, to use, to use the old German saying, it was from 4.12. You know, it's five minutes to midnight when they've woken up. Um, so that's great. Um, by the way, one thing I think they absolutely shouldn't do, and I'd love to talk to people on this call about this, is to ban the AfD. I, I, I really don't think that in a democracy where you have a party which is polling, you know, 30, 40 percent, um, particularly in the East German lender, you can address the issues by banning it. I mean, individuals, yes, Bundesverfassungsschutz and so on, but I don't think you should ban it. You've got to fight it politically. And I, I'm afraid, I mean, I think the civil society mobilization is great, but I think it needs leadership from the parties, the main parties, particularly the Christian Democrats, right? And they're doing exactly the wrong thing, because what you should be doing is stealing the IFD's clothes, not rhetorically, but by effective policies, right? So people are genuinely worried about migration. One has to acknowledge that. So you have to show that you have a, an effective European policy of managed migration. But at the same time, not take over the nationalist, xenophobic, hysterical rhetoric of civilizational panic. And what I think Mats and the CDU are in danger of doing is doing it exactly the wrong way around, right? So you take over the rhetoric of the populace um, but don't have the effective policies. 
Uh, and what that does, and we know that there's good political science evidence on this by now, is it actually increases the vote for the hard right. Okay, because people say, why should I have the dog whistle when I could have the real dog? Yeah. If Mertz is saying the same thing as the RFD, why don't I vote for RFD? So I think an awful lot depends on what the center right, also in France, um, uh, it, it, and then Netherlands and elsewhere, does in the next six months in that respect to kind, kind of push back the hard right. Thank you, um, Timothy. So uh, th there's a question from the audience from Massimo, who is linked to what you just said. And uh, Massimo is asking, how really likely is the scenario of an EPP, so the Conservative uh, Group at the European Parliament, and the idea, uh, the hard right group, coalition at the European Parliament, plus ECR, another bit more conservative group, considering the tense relation between Tusk and the peace or the CDU, Tusk, Donald Tusk, the now prime minister in Poland and the peace, the ultra-conservative party in Poland, or the CDU and the IFD in Germany? Um, just to be clear, because I think there may be a slight misunderstanding there. I think it's ECR and ID that Orban is trying to put together. So it's those two groupings. I mean, there's no question of the EPP. Manfred Weber having been very weak and appeasing on Orban for many, many years, but now the line is clearly drawn. Um, but ECR and ID, if you put them together, um, would be a major force in the in 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 in, in the parliament. Um, um, and and obviously there is the issue, a clear issue of different attitudes to Putin and Moscow. Um, so they may not succeed, but but there is at least that danger. Um, but since you mentioned Donald Tusk. And e who, of course, is parties in the EPP. Um, you know, Poland is one of the really few, really good bits of news from last year to show that you can win an election, an unfair election, in a situation where you've had quite far reaching state capture. Um, now we have this fascinating struggle. How do you restore? liberal democracy in a in a not just a country but a state where some of the key institutions of liberal democracy have been taken over for example the constitutional court um and it's very difficult to do that by legal means it, it's almost as if you you need almost a revolutionary act a peaceful revolutionary act um breaking a specific law, the letter of a law, in order to create the larger condition called the rule of law, right? So it's it's fascinating, also from the point of view of political theory. Um, I would say that the Tusk government is doing extremely well. They're going at it in a very determined way, but with quite a calm rhetoric. Um, um, but, you know, they, they've got to get on with it because otherwise Poland is now going to local elections and then you have the European elections. Um, and if, if in six months time, come June, um, the issues are still all about the past and dealing with peace. And Tusk hasn't turned attention to, you know, education. By the way, he's very significantly increased the salaries for teachers and health service and all the other issues that people really care about, then that's going to be a danger for, 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 for his government. Um, but at the moment, given the difficulties, I think it's still looking good. Um, speaking of rebuilding uh, trust in the state and, and the rule of law, do you think that the, the, the Polish example can be of... Uh, can be of a model for other countries that had this authoritarian uh, drift, like, uh, of course, Hungary and who knows, maybe Belarus, Russia, or? So, Gianpaolo, we have a, a new state form, which is the EU member state, right? 
that's different from any other kind of state in the world or in history. And what one has to understand about countries like Hungary and Poland is that their democratic state building after 1989 was always member state building, right? It was building a state to be compliant with EU standards. Now, in the Hungarian case, um, you have what I call a Potemkin state. In other words, you have a really carefully built facade and Fides has brilliant lawyers who can always find out, oh, but they do this in Portugal or, you know, oh, they do that in Slovenia or they do it in Finland. So you have this Potomkin state with the facade of compliance. And by the way, I think the changes recently made in rule of law are only facade compliance, mm -hmm. right? They don't actually merit releasing 10 billion euros of EU funds. Let that be said very clearly. Um, now, when you get state capture to the extent that it has been achieved in Hungary in a, with this facade of compliance, undoing that is very, very difficult. And, and honestly, I, I, was, I was kind of optimistic about conditionality on issues of democracy and rule of law in the EU. In sort of 2020, 21, I thought we were moving in the right direction. The pressure was really building up. You know, the key point being the Europe of values is is linked to the Europe of money. But tragically, the fact that you need Orban on board for a unanimous decision again and again and again to support Ukraine has meant that that conditionality has been weakened again. So unless you get a really strong force in country, as you have in Poland, uh, winning an election and determined to restore liberal democracy and the rule of law, um, it, it's quite difficult to do. Isn't that, in a way, a, a great lesson for European democracies dealing at the moment with far extreme right-wing groups or the tendency of uh, right-wing groups to take on some of the subjects um, and ideas of the extreme right was to try to deal with it. But I don't know, what's your opinion about the way, the way out of this danger? Yeah, so, so listen, number one, we have to make sure that we really are um, living up to our own standards and values and abiding by our own rules, right? Um, so, for example, public service broadcasting, which was absolutely crucial in the in the peace project in Poland, the fact that TVP, the state TV, was turned into an absolutely poisonous uh, 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 machine for propaganda for the ruling party. I, I can't tell you how vile and mendacious it was. Um, you know, is is a real warning sign. Um, so just to be provincial for a moment and talk about Britain, um, something really worrying in this country is how the independence of the BBC is under threat. Um, um, in other, you know, established member states also, there are challenges to public service broadcasting. So th that's one example of an area where I think we have to be really, really, pay re really close attention. The other thing, Catherine, is, is slightly different. I mean, if you take the German problem, in a way, it's almost the other way around. You have so many exquisite liberal, democratic, and constitutional checks and balances with the competences of the lender and the rulings of the constitutional court, a uh, highly representative coalition government, et cetera, et cetera, that it becomes very difficult to make effective rapid change, right? And that is now the German problem, that it is in a way, in a sort of multiple deadlock, sort of legally, politically, and in a way, psychologically, um, incapable of making the big changes, for example, on the green agenda, uh, that it really needs, because the Constitutional Court has said, uh, you know, you have to respect the debt break and you can't, um, you know, play these tricks to get around it and so on. So that I think I think there are, you know, in a way, there are sort of equal and opposite problems, aren't there? Kind of Scylla and Charybdis. So, so Scylla is where you yourself erode the institutions of liberal democracy. Um, Charybdis is where, as in Germany, you have such an exquisite 
legal and constitutional structure of checks and balances that you can't deliver the policies which will actually win voters back from hard right or indeed extreme left. I mean, think of Zara Wagner. Uh, talking about Hungary, uh, there's a question by uh, Paola, uh, which I'm going to read to you. Is there any sign of a Tusk equivalent in Hungarian politics just now? Anyone who stands a chance of getting elected and would implement the kind of program we are now seeing in Poland, I just add that um, um, Hungary, of course, will uh, take on the rotating EU presidency in the second semester of this year. Yeah. Um, if only. If only. Um, you know, Hungary uh, in spring 2022 had a united opposition. Supposedly, it wasn't terribly united, but they did actually get to that point. Uh, but they lost. And they lost partly because of Orban's state capture. So it wasn't a fair election, but also because the opposition wasn't really united. Um, I, I have to say the election party on the evening of the election in Budapest, which I attended, was, I think, the saddest party I've ever attended. And that's saying an awful lot. Um, because most of the opposition parties didn't even show up to share the defeat. And now it's just all over the place. Um, so I'm afraid the answer is no. But it's interesting, if you look, Turkey, united opposition, weak candidate, opposition lost, just. Hungary, united opposition, weak candidate, opposition lost. Poland actually divided opposition. Mm. We were all very worried because the opposition hadn't united. There were three party groupings. But strong leaders of all three, or at least for two of them, opposition wins. So, you know, I think I think there's a kind of a learning process there about how you actually how how, how you go about winning an unfair election. Um Staying in that part of Europe, uh, there's a question from you again. Um, regarding your very long experience with East Germany and similar regions, what would you recommend to establish and expand democratic and liberal thinking in rural regions and among citizens with authoritarian traditions? So is there a recipe for uh, the, let's call them the rural population who are more conservative? Respect. That would be my one word answer. Pay attention. You know, the lines from Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman, attention must be paid. And um, respect people who have different values, different lifestyles, different priorities um, from us liberal internationalist Europeans, if I can say that, living in you know nice cities and speaking various languages, because as we all know, populism everywhere over the last 10 years in Europe has both an economic and a cultural dimension, right? Always in different proportions and different variations, but there's always both economic and cultural. And the cultural component is a lot about you remote liberal metrosexual elites um, don't pay any attention to us, you ignore us, you disrespect us, uh, you call us fascists because, you know, we were critical of LGBTQ or have different views on abortion or, you know, like the church or whatever. I mean, those are the sentiments that, that have driven populism everywhere. And so and so having a, a conversation which starts with what philosophers call recognition respect you know there's an interesting distinction between recognition respect and appraisal respect so recognition respect says i don't agree with your views but i respect you as an equal human being and citizen having those views and i'm paying attention and i'm listening um that may sound a bit woolly but actually i think in in the real politics it it really matters and and you know, and then and then the populists come along, 
and um, people in in you know quote unquote left behind areas say, oh, here's a guy who gets us. He speaks like us, right? He looks like us. I mean, that's part of the Trump phenomenon too. Um, we went now back to the the issue of the far right and and, and populists. Um, actually, we are talking like if it was something completely separated the populist parties and far right parties from the mainstream parties. But actually, what several uh, political analysts and one of them notably is Cas Mude, uh, a Dutch political analyst uh, teaching at um, Georgia University in the US, who uh, and also a regular host here, and who regularly says that um, actually the far right, let's say the, the yeah, the far right uh, narrative it has been absorbed by the mainstream parties. So the far right parties did, don't even have to be in power for their program or their ideas to have slowly become something mainstream that has uh, trickled down to the population. Do you have the same feeling? And if it's so, how to com how to combat this? Is the um, the recognition respect you mentioned a way? Uh, there, getting there. So, I, I think I started addressing that, Giampaolo, in my answer about uh, the CDU and AfD. It's um, rhetoric or policy reality, right? And and I think center right parties, and I absolutely agree with Cass, who's written great stuff on this, have got it just the wrong way around. They adopt the, the rhetoric without delivering anything effective in, 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 in real policy. And it needs to be it needs to be the other way around. And I would like to see center right leaders much clearer in their critique and rejection of nationalism as opposed to patriotism. I mean, the famous distinction patriotism is love of your own country. Nationalism is hatred of other peoples. Very simple, but pretty useful. And 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 to be much clearer in their rejection of nationalism and xenophobia. And and you know, it's kind of embarrassing to see that sort of semantic appeasement, right? I mean, Rishi Sunak, who's obviously a cosmopolitan guy, you know, trying to become a sort of tub thumping Colonel Blimp. And stop the boats and so on. Um, it's not even credible. And as I said, if 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 our mainstream politicians do that, then voters say, well, I'd rather have Nigel Farage or I'd rather have Marine Le Pen. So also in the case of France, I mean, I can understand why Macron thinks he couldn't go on doing en même temps, en même temps, and that he had to sort of tend centre right or centre left. That I can understand. But the kind of appeasement of the right, using the votes of the Rassemblement National to get your, you know, immigration bill through, um, that seems to me massively problematic and is going to boomerang uh, and only going to be counterproductive. Okay, um, thanks. Um, just a commentary uh, I'd like to read to you from uh, Ulrike. On the AFD, I mean, that banning, actually banning the um, AF AFD would just bring it back in another form. So that's just a commentary. Maybe yeah. you want to say a word on that. And then there's two questions that are more ge geopolitical, uh, like, like to read. Do you want to comment on the commentary or? I, I agree. Do you want to ban a party? I agree. You agree. Okay. Um, so there was a question earlier on from Stefania. Um, can I ask um, how many changes will follow to a further re-election of Trump in particular, and hot to see as the Middle East, Russia, Ukraine war, and Taiwan too? In according to Taiwan, the Obama policy pivot to Asia, it could be over. So that's one question. And the other one um, from uh, Massimo, the world seems divided in diversity. What is the future for multilateralism, even if Trump does not win? Two great questions. Trump, first thing to say, he's going to be more extreme 
and more unpredictable than he was in his first term. So in that sense, prediction becomes more difficult. On the other hand, there are now detailed plans by friendly think tanks like the Heritage Foundation for what he's going to do in the second term. So we have much clearer indications of the direction of travel. And beside him clearly saying, I'm going to make a deal with Putin and end the war in Ukraine in 24 hours. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a potential disaster for Ukraine. One other big element I would pick up is that he's, he has a quite an influential advisor called Elbridge Colby, uh, who is saying the only thing that really matters geopolitically for the United States is China. And what we have to do is to rapidly draw down our presence and support for Europe, to concentrate all our resources, military, intelligence, diplomatic, you name it, on China, and particularly on the threat to Taiwan. So I think that that's something that we really should be planning for. Um, that yeah, obviously we've been talking about the pivot to Asia for forever, but there's a really quite concrete plan, um, actually rather well articulated. I mean, in in my view, mistaken, because if Ukraine loses to Putin that clearly encourages Xi Jinping to have a go at Taiwan, right? So if Putin gets away with it in Ukraine. Um, so I don't think the logic is right, but that's the argument that is being made. And so I think, you know, that that's that's a, a very big um, aspect of, of Trump that we have to be, you know, very actively uh, preparing for, which means beefing up European defense. So I just did this column in The Guardian saying, you know, Maybe you'd like to organize a conference on the 70th anniversary of the failure of the uh, European defense community uh, in the Assemblée Nationale uh, on the 30th of August, um, 1954, to look at what more we can do for, for European defense. Now, on the, on the international system, I would, if I may, can commend to you a piece I wrote with Ivan Krastev and Mark Leonard on the ECFR website, based on some extensive polling we did in um, 10 countries outside Europe, uh, China, India, Turkey, Russia, US, South Korea, South Africa, Indonesia, and so on, Saudi Arabia, um, which is called an a la carte world. And it seems to me quite clear that that is the world in which we're entering, a world in which non-European great powers like India, Turkey, South Africa, not to mention Russia and China, will simply pursue their national interests case by case and it will be transactional if you like it'll be more like late 19th century europe than late 20th century europe mm -hmm. and um you can see that in the reactions of india or turkey to the war in ukraine we're fine dealing with russia you don't want to buy russia's oil says india we'll buy russia's oil it's good for our economy and so i think we as europeans have to have to work out how we respond to that right and rather than waffling on about the global south um say what's going to be our india strategy what's going to be our turkey strategy what's our south africa strategy and in particular how do we strike the balance between interests and values given that these countries are pursuing a very old-fashioned they want to say european style realpolitik in which it's all about interests and not at all about values. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Timothy. So you, you were mentioning uh, the, the US focusing uh, possibly on China as their main uh, concern. But actually, uh, I have the feeling that the, the biggest factor of China seeks stability, uh, most of all, while the biggest factor of instability worldwide uh, is Russia. Uh, at least uh, to my opinion. Um, do you think that, is, is there a way to deal with the current Russia? Is there a hope that at some point it might come back into the realm of uh, frequentable countries and be a factor of stability again, or it's lost? So 
I mean, just one word on China Jampalo, which is, I think, the key to understanding Xi Jinping. And there's a very good essay recently by Kerry Brown on this, which you can find online, is the stability of the party. Mm. Right? I mean, he is a genuine Leninist in the sense that for him, the absolute priority is the preservation of Communist Party rule and, and the success of Communist Party rule, and everything is subordinated to that. To the Russia question, um, my dear friend Ivan Krastev said recently that we used to have a Russia policy and no Ukraine policy. Now we have a Ukraine policy, but no Russia policy. Mm. I think that's not I understand what he's saying, but I think that's not quite right, because I think at the moment our Ukraine policy is our Russia policy. Right. So. For Putin, his Ukraine policy is his Russia policy. He thinks that Ukraine is Russia. And belongs in them with Russia. So if we manage to support Ukraine. To get out finally, after centuries, out of the Russian Empire, such that Russia can no longer be this imperial power that Putin, and by the way, many, many Russians believe it has to be because that's what Russia is, then Russia starts a process of saying, okay, we've lost an empire. Now we have to start finding a role. And, 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 as and when that process starts, i.e. after Putin, and I, I'm happy to concede that what comes after Putin may be chaotic and dangerous and may even be worse. There's no reason for hanging on to Putin. But as and when we get to that post-Putin moment where Russia says that we've lost an empire and have to find a role, then I think we in Europe have to be ready to engage big time in talking about you know, Russia's place absolutely in Europe. I mean, it's self-evidently the case. And this is the one thing on which I disagree with my Ukrainian friends at the moment. It's self-evidently the case hmm. that Europe doesn't end at some arbitrary frontier line, which is the frontier of the Russian Federation. 